Okay. My name is Anissa Daudi. I'm a linguist and uh, translation studies uh, academic. Uh, I feel really privileged this afternoon, th th this evening, to host this series of, uh, of events organized by, uh, Arabic, uh, by the Arabic Studies and the Translation Studies Research Forum at the University of Birmingham. Uh, it is also part of the Forging Links research stream at the university. Uh, this inaugural uh, lecture by Professor Louise von Floto comes under a series of, uh, of events called the Transnational Feminist Translation, which will be followed by three sessions. One by uh, the first one, uh, the next one will be by uh, Olga Castro, then uh, uh, Ruth Abu Rashid, and Lemia, uh, Lemia Ben Yusuf. Uh, I would like, before we start, to thank our uh, to thank our two experts, uh, IT experts, Miss uh, Dega uh, Rutherford, Rutherford, PhD student, who helped me organize this event, and uh, Lamin Bisker, uh, an IT engineer in Busada, Algeria. Uh, well, I start. I consider this event as uh, as a uh, a tra transnational action par uh, par excellence. Uh, with us. Uh, with us today, uh, today in this session, we have uh, graduates and post -grad and uh, and postgraduates uh, as well as scholars from the Arab region, including T Tunisia, Morocco, and uh, Algeria, as well as from Latin American countries and Asia. Wow. Uh, it's what makes the what makes it transnational is our shared views and interest in other cultures, uh, languages and the feminist movement all around the world. Uh, we, we try to be, we, what, uh, the, uh, the aim is to be away from the dichotomies of uh, South, North, East, West, uh, and, and beyond basically all borders that you might imagine, imaginary or physical. Uh, and for that, actually, I couldn't find a better person to start this session, this, this series, than uh, Professor Louise Van Floto, who has worked in this area for, for decades and whose publication is all about transnational and feminist translation. Uh, uh, what, I, what I thought, I'm not going to give like the uh, uh, traditional um, uh, introduction of listing uh, uh, Louise's uh, achievement, but what I will, do, uh, what I will say is uh, that uh, uh, Louise van Floto is a translation scholar, as you know. She has taught translation studies at the University of uh, Ottawa in, uh, in Canada since 1996. Her main research interests have focused on feminist and uh, gender issues in translation, translation as uh, cultural diplomacy and audiovisual translation. Her publications include uh, articles and books authored and edited in this area, uh, in these areas. I'm going to just single out what her latest book, edited volume with, uh, with Hela Kamel 2020, and the title is The Routledge Handbook on Translation, Feminism and uh, Gender. Uh, and uh, basically, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to uh, Louise uh, Van Floto. Thank you so much, please, the floor is yours. Okay, I can, you hear me, I can speak, I can go ahead? Uh, please, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <coughs> so, good evening everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm talking in Canada. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, probably where most of you are, it's uh, quite different, maybe early evening already. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the move of feminist translation, ideas about feminist translation, from a very local space, very local situation where they developed maybe 20, 30 years ago to a much, much larger transnational space that uh, we are all part of now. And, and, which, and, and this is um, a talk that came out of producing this book that Anissa just talked about, the Rutledge Handbook on Translation, Feminism and Gender, big, fat volume, as you can see, almost 400 pages. And a few of the people who have published in this are on, on the board right now. Olga, hello, thank you for participating. Ruth, thank you for participating. And I imagine that there are some others out there listening in who also participated. This 
the production of this book really, really opened my eyes to the many challenges that we have when we try to move a particular uh, theoretical structure onto and into other language, other culture combinations and so on. And that's really what I want to talk about and want to emphasize how local um, the original or yeah, the 1970s ideas around feminist translation were and how they have broadened and ha need to broaden. And yeah, talk about mainly that for, for the time being. For those who are interested, I have produced a, a PowerPoint, but I prefer not to use it because I think PowerPoints are rigid. <laughs> and tie me down to something and make people read the screen rather than listen and so on. So I prefer not to use it. So, but I'm happy to circulate it. If uh, I can send it later on to Anissa and then she can circulate it to whoever wants or whoever participates, okay? So um, to start with, uh, so here are three examples of how I, we in, in putting together this book have faced and uh, more recent ones as well, have faced translation, feminist translation challenges that come out of this big transnational um, um, initiative of feminism as a transnational um, activity and, and event. One uh, comes from an article that was not published, but that I'm working on now, together with a woman called Alanud al Sharek. Alanud is Kuwaiti, as far as I know, but she's working in Washington, D.C. right now in a, in, a, in a think tank and wrote an article, which, which she couldn't finish because she was too busy, that focused on the problem of what is called in English, honor killing. But what is called in Arabic, something quite different, sometimes family discipline, sometimes disciplinary violence, uh, when you translate literally the Arabic into English. And, and the, the question is, what happens when the English term is so uh, murderous on a killing and does not discuss or does not allow for other possible cultural differences and adaptations? So that's one question. Another example is just the word gender itself. Uh, which has been translated and used and applied in so many different ways, often not translated, usually not translated, turned into Arabic as al-gender by Hala Kamal, into other terms by other people. There's no, there seems to be very little um, agreement on what is actually meant by the term. And a very nice example also from this book comes from a, an article that was written by Tatiana Bartunova, in Novosibirsk in, in Russia about the translation of feminist materials from West to East to, uh, to, to uh, refer to that binary that you want out of here um, in the 1990s. In the 1990s, there was a big push uh, and lots of money coming from places like the Soros Foundation and other, other funding agencies to translate political thought and ideology and political philosophy, uh, including feminism, to, into Russian. And what uh, Bartunova describes as naive translators took on these translation jobs, which were well paid, and had to deal with words like gender, translating them into Russian, agency, and empowerment, which in North American, Anglo-American feminism, have acquired very precise meanings and, and very, yeah, have, have been generalized and used broadly. In 1990s Russia, these translators couldn't figure out what is empowerment? What does the word mean in the first place? And when, when applied to feminists and women's interests and so on, how is it translatable? And often the translations produce the opposite of what the English said and so on and so forth. So a, a, a real gap in understanding and in meaning. Most recently, there's been an interesting development in Germany where the Duden, which is the biggest official dictionary uh, and, and language kind of authority has decided that they will gender the German language 
and insert the feminine form of the masculine words as a separate ending. So you will have citizen and female citizen as separate, uh, as separate, um, what would you call it? Separate terms in the dictionary. So bürger, uh, male, bürgerinnen, female, student, student, male, studentinnen, as though they were completely different words. Of course, there's a huge outcry over this. And, uh, but I, what I find amusing is that the German outcry revolves around the verb gendern, gendern. So they've taken the noun gender from English and turned it into a verb gendern. So they are in the process of gendering the German language in, in a way which, which uh, may or may not have something to do with the term uh, of gender, the way it was used or the way it is, tends to be used in Anglo-American. So lots of, there are lots of different ways where we can see that the translation of this material that comes often and, and largely from Anglo-American and European sources into other, other cultures, other languages, uh, causes, causes yeah, considerable considerable problems. One final example uh, from my own experience, I gave a talk years ago in Tehran at one of the universities and it had to do with Bible translation and how, how various, uh, various uh, um, articles and other translations have been produced that take a very feminine perspective and feminist perspective into account. At the end of the talk, there was a girl who raised her hand, a woman, women sitting at the back of the class, boys sitting at the front of the class, who raised her hand and said, yeah, very interesting, but what does this have to do with us? What does feminist Bible translation have to do with us here in Iran? And that really was also an eye opener. When you see how your own concerns, which come out of the culture from which you are uh, producing work and which from which you are analyzing things has little or nothing to do with the culture to which you are introducing this material or, or where you're talking about it. So huge gaps that I think this um, transnational approach or transnational initiative can work to fill or at least recognize and, and, and discuss and so on. So first of all, a couple of definitions, which I think are important because uh, there's often kind of yeah, misunderstanding as far as I'm concerned. First of all, the difference between feminist translation and feminist translation studies. Feminist translation for me is, or comprises actions, activities, interventions undertaken in texts by translators, editors, publishers, all in the name of feminist politics, or feminist culture, feminist change, and so on. So it's actually the work on the text that is feminist translation. It includes also the selection of which texts you're going to translate. Yeah, and deselection of texts you do not wish to translate. Uh, feminist translation studies, on the other hand, is more of an academic approach to studying translations from a feminist perspective. So studying the methods that have been deployed by scholars or journalists or academics to write about translations or to focus on women writers and the translations done of their work or to focus on, on what happens with women's health texts, for instance, that famous book, Our Bodies, Ourselves. And when it's translated into Arabic or into Persian or into uh, South American, Latino, uh, Spanish and so on. So focusing on on analysis from a perspective, from a feminist perspective, that for me would be feminist translation studies. So there are two quite different uh, separate items. Another, what I think is really useful definition of feminism, there are many of them, and this one is super simple and works across all genders and could work across all cultures as far as I'm concerned by bell hooks dates from the 1970s. Feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation and sexist oppression. So if we leave it as open as that, sexism can apply to any genders, 
sexist exploitation, same way, sexist oppression, the same way. All that to um, make the claim that feminism can also work on behalf of and in line with and in collaboration with LGBTQI genders uh, with all kinds of different approaches to the questions that are raised by sexism or the problems that are raised by sexism. Gender, the term gender, obviously uh, people have written enough about it. It comes from, from the differentiation in the US originally between biological sex and sociocultural aspects of sexual difference and sexual behavior or sexualized behavior, but then has been expanded in the 1990s by various people, Butler included, Denaretis and so on to address various other genders and then to focus on gender as a discursive um, thing, something taught and caught and spread by language, uh, as well as, of course, physicality, the performative and the per and performance of gender. And I think nowadays it the, to, to talk about genders in the plural implies being open to recognizing fluidity, changeability, and also the dignity of whatever gender uh, form is being presented or is being made available or is there in a book or on, on text or on screen. Right, and um, gender aware reading for translation. We've had a number of publications on that topic. How can you read a text if you are going to translate it? And how can you get into this when you are an academic trying to see whether the text has been translated in a gender aware uh, way? Um, gender aware for me means looking at and being aware of the discursive aspects of gender, how gender is caught and taught in language and, and, and then how the use or abuse or misuse or deliberate satiric use of that language then undoes those gender uh, rules that have been been caught in language. Um, also, obviously, language presents various different gender identities, and that has to also be recognized and often is not recognized. And so there's a, an article in this book on on film translation uh, where the the, uh, the academic shows that the gender um, the gendered language in the Anglo-American film, some Hollywood film or various Hollywood films, completely bypasses the dubbers. And the dubbing, the dubbing translation turns this movie or these movies or television series into the most traditional binary male-female uh, situations, completely ignoring or not recognizing the fact that the language is, is very much plural in terms of gender. So those are a few kind of basic ideas that I think are important. Now, to go to this local aspect of feminist translation that I, I talked about, I think most people who've, who've read, um, read stuff that I've written know that, in, that, that I think, at least, <laughs> a lot of this feminist translation material came from Canada. Because Canada is bilingual, Canada had just become officially bilingual in 1968. And in the 70s, poof, there was a huge um, development of, of texts being written by Francophone, Francophone women, largely, in Quebec, French speaking, in Quebec, who were making yeah, names for themselves, responding to a very hard line Marxist uh, uh, and um, kind of revolutionary uh, discourse that had to do with separatism, separating Quebec from, from the rest of Canada. And these women, intellectual writers, thinkers, and so on, were of the same generation, but were, and were part of that separatist movement for a time until, and many of them have written about it, they were completely excluded by the men of their generation. And they said, hey, what's going on here? We are part of this, but we are not part of this. And then using reference to Hélène Sixou, who came to teach at the University of Montreal, uh, Luce Irigaray, who also came to teach in, in Montreal at various points, 
were very became very motivated about language and how the language, again, uh, at that time in French, determines gender, determines power, determines authority, and so on, and so began to write against that language. The idea being that any woman who is a writer is using a language at that point, 1970s French, that works against her and against all other women. Because for one very simple reason, the masculine always is more important than the feminine, right? In, in all romance languages. So th there was this, this um, upswing of very strong responses um, in terms of experimental writing, in terms of experimenting with language, and and in terms of also publishing about what they were doing in journals that they founded. There's a nice journal called La Vie en Rose. There's another one called Les Têtes de Pioche, um, which were founded more or less at the same time where they explain what they're doing because those texts that they produced were not necessarily easy to read and were not necessarily um, uh, fun to translate either. However, because Canada was pushing this bilingualism and there was money to promote bilingualism and there was also funding, government funding to do research on each other, on the French aspect of Canada and the English aspect of Canada. There was a lot of academic interest in what was being produced in France or not in France, in Quebec, in French, then the relations to France and then it's the meaningfulness of this material for the rest of Canada and for the for the women's movement and feminist movements in the rest of Canada. And out of that came feminist translation. And it really, um, it really uh, depended on basically two, three, four women. Four, let's say, Quebec writers who were very productive and very, very radical. And then two or three Anglophone translators who were university professors or willing also to write about what they were doing and, and, and speak about what they were doing, all of them with very close connections to Montreal, all of them knowing each other, meeting each other, organizing events and conferences together. So very much a tight circle that supported and helped each other and, and yeah, worked together. So, and very much aware that what they were doing was political work. And one of these, um, Oh, yeah, and then I, I have a little thing here that I've, I've included, which is that um, what the Quebec women were doing and what perhaps derived from or was also co-inspired by, by work from Hélène Sixou and from uh, uh, Lucie Rigaray was not only happening in Quebec and France, but also in English. Mary Daly, Marge Piercy, Ursula Le Guin, Margaret Atwood are names that you could name from that period in English who, who wrote fiction where the language became feminized or, or yeah. In German, Verena Stefan, Louise Pusch, uh, in French, I already said. In Norwegian, Gert Brandenberg, who, um, who wrote a book called Egalia's Daughters, where the whole the whole uh, society is suddenly shifted around and women are in charge and, da, 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 and, and the, 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 it's, a, it's a really, really heavy satire on the conditions of patriarchal society. Um, and all of this material was translated. Uh, Margaret Atwood tra translated into German, Mary Daly translated into German, but none of those translations produced feminist translation. <laughs> they may have been feminist translation, but nobody wrote about it. The translators didn't insist on what they were doing. The translators didn't theorize what they were doing. And, and in Canada, they did. And in Canada, the big name for, for all of this was Barbara Goddard, um, who translated much of the material that came out of Quebec, wrote great long prefaces to explain or to try to explain what was going on and then wrote articles, organized conferences. She was very visible and very voluble. Uh, when you came across her at conferences, um, founded journals. There's a journal called Tessera, which is now defunct, I think, but which she founded. And she devised this term that most of us recognize, which is that a feminist translator woman handles a text, right? Taking the term manhandle, which is to be rough and, 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 and hard on something, 
and to say that, turn it into woman handling a text. And she also came up with this, with this uh, idea that the translator flaunts her presence in the text. In other words, the exact opposite of what we have known for many years and many generations is that translators are invisible and should be invisible and are best um, not seen and not heard and just do the work and disappear. So for her, it was important to, to be visible and to explain what she's doing and to make the changes in the text and to mark them, put a footnote. Here I changed the text because I needed to do this or that. And um, very, uh, yeah, she was very effective and, and, uh, and clearly could present what she was doing and regularly went to Montreal and various other places to meet up with these people and, inter and, and meet them in conferences. The other person that played an important role, I think, is Suzanne de Lobinier Harwood. She published one book about her activities called La Traduction comme pratique de réécriture au féminin. So the body bilingual translation as rewriting in the feminine, which is a quite a thin book published 1991. Very personal, very sometimes very emotional account of her work as a translator working with and for uh, women's texts and women's language and so on and, and pointing out again and again where the existing translations have deliberately or accidentally misrepresented women's words and so on. So those two were two of the more, two of the original uh, translators. And I think that they played a huge role in making uh, their approaches to translation visible and theorizing them and politicizing them. So when people talk about the Canadian school <laughs> of translation studies, I also always have to laugh because it's, consists of about two people, or maybe three, maybe four, max. Um, but it, it certainly is something that, that came out of this particular very local situation. And I wrote an article on this a while ago, it came out in 2006, yeah, 14 years ago, um, where you can see, you can apply the ideas of Bourdieu to this particular group that created a field of feminist work in translation feminist work first, and then in translation, that gained visibility and so-called cultural capital in the process, really became well-known and, and internationally visible. Um, earned economic capital. Barbara Goddard earned research grants, study and publishing funds. Mm -hmm. And when I got into it in 1991, I, oh no, earlier, 85, I got funding three years of PhD research funding from the government of Canada to to proceed in work on this topic. I don't know where else that would have that money would have been available. Um, and also in the in the process, we all um, going around in circles, meeting each other and talking at conferences and so on, developed what what Bourdieu would call social capital. So lots of networking, lots of connections and friendships and, and publishing contracts and so on. But or and we addressed Canadian topics. Canadian topics, very local situations, Canadian history, Canadian politics, and didn't reach out in, in grand, or at least I don't think, maybe we did now and then into grand, large, um, <clears throat> other cultural applications of what was going on in Canada. That was done kind of for us in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, so I've talked about academic and government support, which I think is really quite important and hasn't been discussed much. So all of this brought out a number of books and articles and so on until until the early until the the term genders came became pluralized, the term queer became readily available, which was yeah, early nineties, nineteen into the mid 90s and so on. And, and where gender and queer developments with Teresa de Lorette as Judith Butler and so on, basically changed the focus for 20 years, I would say. Well, 10, 10 15, 10, 12, 15 years, really changed the focus. And, and feminism suddenly um, became viewed as a kind of outdated binary, 
um, political idea, which was no longer no longer acceptable, no longer valuable. Um, where, for instance, the category of woman was no longer acceptable in social science fields, uh, political science studies, um, in um, international development. One of my daughters was at the London School of Economics during that time and in development studies and was not allowed to use to refer to women in a particular country or in a particular culture. The category of women had been blown to shreds which is a political move as far as I'm concerned, because genders may be there, plural, yes, very good, but there are still multiple women in multiple situations of, of problematic uh, authority and so on in power. And yeah, John Scott and I have written about this um, problem, yeah. so. I kept my mouth shut for a while there and, and felt somewhat intimidated by all of this because I don't know much about, or I didn't at the time and I didn't have time to go into it about genders plural and how that might apply to translation and what it means for translation studies. However, by 2011, um, for me, it was time to write about women again, which, and that book came out, Translating Women. But in the meantime, Someone like Keith Harvey, whose name many of you probably know, uh, he was one of the very few academics who early on was able to bring the notion of, of plural genders or other genders into the discourse around translation and, and into translation studies with the work that he did on camp language and its translatability into into others other languages but his focus was French English so relatively closely related uh, cultures and then on the on the translation of gay or homosexual episodes and characters um, in literature in French literature translated into English and vice versa English literature translated into French in his book which came out in 2004 but there wasn't much else right away in translation studies. It's like it, it, the, this focus on gender, on genders, plural, really um, took some time to develop in terms of, of academic work, how to think about how that might apply uh, to actual translation work. Now, there are numerous publications on the topic, but they tend to date from about 2014 onwards. So it took a good, 20 years from, let's say, the, the appearance of Butler's gender trouble, good 20 years for the repercussions to be visible in translation studies with a text, with work from Brian Baer, for instance, um, a collection of texts on homosexually identified texts and translation by Baer and Kindle that came out in 2017 called Queering Translation, Translating the Queer. Um, another one that came out in 2017 um, called also Queer in Translation, Queer Aspects of Translation. That's the one that I think is really interesting. Um, the way feminist approaches to translation focused in, in that famous article by Chamberlain on how translation has always been coded and always been uh, referred to metaphorically as a feminine, female, lower level, reproductive, um, repetitive activity. Now we have an approach to translation that, that sees translation as queering a text. And that comes out of this queer theory. And I think it's really interesting, the, the fact that that translation, again, is no longer just reproductive or, or repetitive, but now sets out to queer a text, whatever that might mean. But it's a nice theoretical approach that comes out of out of this pluralizing of, of gender. Um, and then the, the most recent change or the most recent impact on translation is, or on feminist translation is the notion of intersectionality. And I haven't worked on it much, but I have a student who worked on that for her PhD and looked at the translation of Our Bodies, Ourselves, which is a famous uh, book written in the 1970s, it was a little pamphlet in the 1970s, now it's a four volume book in English 
um, which has to do with women's reproductive health, uh, published in the US and translated many times. There's a, a book by um, Davis, Kathy Davis, published, that came out in 2007 or so on some of the translation problems that have arisen out of that book, which is on reproductive health, so sexuality, on abortion, on childbirth, and so on. And it's translation into all those other languages of the world, about 37 languages of the world. My PhD student, Nezrin Besai, was involved in a project to translate four or five chapters of this book into French for Quebec in an intersectional way, taking account of all of the all of the other issues that come up when we think more intersectionally. And the result is, is very interesting. Um, among other things, you the, the, the woman in the text or the women in the text disappear and become persons. Luckily in French, luckily in French, la personne is feminine. <laughs> but you have odd, odd structures where you have le vagin du partenaire peut être ça, 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 ça. So you have the vagina of the partner, the vagina feminine of the partner masculine um, can you know do this or that um, because the purpose is to include as many people as possible to that that would feel themselves addressed by the book, including people who are in transition or who have transition, people who have one or two different are, are multi gender and so on. Um, very interesting work and difficult because it involved focus groups, it involved preparing a translation and then sending it to these focus groups of the different, um, of, of yeah, representing different kind of uh, pressure groups in, in society and asking them, what do you think of this translation? Where should it change? Where should the wording change? And so on. Multiply um, involved people in this text. It's called corps à corps. So corps as in body, C-O-R-P-S, and then accord, accord, A-C-C-O-R-D, guide de sexualité positive, a guide to positive sexuality. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And her dissertation is all about the work that went into trying to, trying to find a way to get um, intersectionality into the translation around gender, topics and especially this topic of women's reproductive health. So from there, towards this notion of transnational feminist and gender aware translation studies, you would think that translation is by definition transnational, working across and despite linguistic and cultural borders and so on. But there are two aspects to think about, I think, and that is that translation studies, at least, has been dominated or have been dominated by Anglo-American and European uh, discourses and publications, very strongly promoted in English. When we think of this book here, there are 41 articles in it. 36 of them were written by non-English speakers or people whose first language is not English. So they, only six or seven, therefore, written by people who can write smoothly and easily in English. So those 36 people who wrote about their particular topics in, in English as a second language or English as a third language are struggling to express themselves and are struggling to be heard and are struggling to, to write at a level that English, an English publisher like Rutledge would publish, would allow. Um, so there's, there's that when we talk, it's, you know, when we talk about transnational feminist translation studies, I think that's one really big question to keep in mind. And that is this, this power of English. And then the, the other item, which is kind of odd is that very little is translated into English. English scholars or Anglophone scholars write about translation, but <laughs> Very little is translated into English. The translation goes from English into other languages uh, very often, not only, but very often. 
And the other, the other um, maybe drawback or item to think about is that transnational feminism has come to refer to including, or reaching out to, and, and encouraging others. Yes, that's a that's a positive and a maybe desirable thing to do, but it also come can come across as kind of um, uh, what would you say? In German, you'd say herablassend. <laughs> you'd say in English, condescending, condescending, right? Um, so, but yeah, so so when when we publish this book. And, and bring in and commission and ask for articles from other places. Is it a condescending move? Is it an inclusive move? There's still that editing work that goes on that I had to do uh, to a great extent. Hard to know, hard to know, but in any case, uh, the transnational aspect now seems to be at least um, partly that way that it reaches out tries to include, tries to encourage and bring together what, what you would call South-South or South-North. So bringing, bringing information and bringing uh, acad academia from other parts of the world into the Anglo-American and European uh, environment, which has been so powerful. And the attitudes driving this, I'm just going to check and see how much time I have. Hang on a sec. Couple of minutes more, okay? <laughs> The attitudes driving this, I think, want to recognize this, in a way, local and colonialist aspect of Anglo-American European work or, and feminisms, and also seek to mitigate that. So by expanding and, or ignoring borders, like in the book by um, uh, Sonia Alvarez and De Lima Costa, the book about tra translocalidades, where they they try to reach out to Latina and Latino and across South America and across all the, all the boundaries in South America and toward English. Bring in new discourses into academia. For instance, this notion of Islamic feminism, which I came across the first time when someone proposed an article um, for a book on translation and how it plays into and is used by, visible in Islamic feminism, I thought. Well, I've never heard of Islamic feminism. <laughs> it was it was a really interesting learning experience, and then so bringing this new material into into academia, into traditional academia, and then also to raise questions about transnational aspects, post and neo colonialism. For instance, I've just worked on something called on this notion of gender mainstreaming. Where does that come from? What does it mean when the UN in English devises something they call gender mainstreaming and it is then applied in Pakistan and in the Philippines and in South Africa? Who knows right? what does what it means in its applications and its translation in each individual place? The general very positive idea is to incorporate the other, listen to the other, publish and read and understand the other and not impose uh, Anglo-American and European um, feminisms. So recent transnational work in translation studies includes um, the two books that came out in 2017. So one was one was um, that I edited together with Farzan and Farazad in, in Tehran. Uh, again, reaching out and trying to find work from various other parts of the world and then editing it so that it's publishable in English. So from Japan, from Saudi Arabia, uh, Cuba, Sri Lanka, and so on. Um, and then the book that Olga Castro and Emek Ergun published in the same year, 2017, called Feminist Translation Studies, Local and Transnational Perspectives, where they also have quite um, theoretical and programmatic essays on the need for post-colonial feminism and post-colonial queer translation studies, and then also individual articles on feminist translation in action. And then most recently, um, an issue of the journal that comes from Colombia, from Medellin, called Mutatis Mutandis, again, where a number of us were involved in, in trying to promote something that you could call transnational feminist translation studies with work from Turkey, from Spain, or Turkey with uh, Suzanne, uh, with Shebnem, Suzam Sarajeva, so Scotland, Turkey, Spain, Brazil, Argentina, and really 
pushing it into Latin America, where there has not been much work on feminist translation and feminist approaches to translation. So the challenges that we've, we've encountered um, are numerous, of course. One of the really big ones um, is that, like in the work by Barbara Goddard 30 years ago, you need to write long prefaces, it seems to me. You need to explain either in footnotes or in prefaces what is going on in the text if you're translating a text from English into Hindi, for instance, or from, uh, from Chilean Spanish into English, Chilean literature from the 1930s into English. There are so many issues in there that are that could be called feminist and that could be looked at from a feminist perspective, but they need explanation. The one wonderful example that's also uh, comes up in this, in the book, The Rutledge Handbook, is from Garima Sharma, who is uh, an Indian uh, student, a student from India, doing a PhD in Germany, in German. And she wrote about a room of one's own. So Virginia Woolf, the proto one of the prototypical articles on uh, feminism, of Anglo-American feminism translated into Hindi. <laughs> and of course, she finds all kinds of things where the, the two Hindi versions have no idea what Virginia Woolf is, is writing about or either accidentally or deliberately um, undermine what, what, what her argument is. But most importantly, and for me, most uh, concretely, the book, one of the books, is sold with a cover that shows a beautiful room your totally European room with, with a window and flowers outside and curtains and heavy European furniture in that room. And uh, Garima writes, a room that Indian women, especially in the rural areas or in large and joint families might dream of having, but can never imagine. So the book is presented with this, with this cover that has nothing to do with the local readership and may well therefore bypass the local readership, um, yeah, or at least at least um, interrupt or disturb the reading of it, let alone the textual issues that, that come up. And there's a nice example also from uh, Chile, like I said, the Chilean, the Chilean article from, from our handbook focuses on writing texts by women from the 1930s and 1940s written in South America, where very often there's a nana in the story. And the nana is an indigenous woman who comes from a village in the mountains or in the desert and moves to the big city to look after rich people's children for the rest of her life and lives in a little room behind the kitchen and but is there as an emotional and psychological support for these little children who are often whose mothers and fathers are busy with other things. So the translation of the Nana and the image of the Nana and the work of the Nana has to, according to the, the authors, has to take into account not only the emotional role and the emotional component of her work, but also the inequities and the inequalities that that character embodies, which we, readers in Canada or readers in the UK or readers elsewhere would not necessarily know, but which are inherent in the text and in the work that that Nana does, which any Chilean reader of the original would know. So again, looks like, for me at least, it looks as though explanations are needed. And then, like I said, uh, the one of the really big issues is this power of English, um, which, which, uh, needs to learn to listen and understand and accommodate and edit properly other people's materials uh, because, like it or not, academic publication is still done very much in English, is important to be published in English. Um, publishing in English makes a text transnational or international. We got a long letter from Barchinova, my, my friend in Siberia, on that topic, she said, if people were only writing their texts in Hindi or in Spanish or in whatever language, I would be completely out of it. If I were writing my texts in Russian, all of those people who read and write in Hindi and Spanish and English wouldn't be able to read it. So English, there are arguments for and against, obviously, 
um, but that that happens to be the case of how we are working at the moment and will probably work for the next while. And it's something that has to be addressed and recognized. Yeah, and I think that's about it there for the challenges. There are many others, of course, <laughs> of course, uh, to get back to the honor killing versus family discipline one. Uh, the, this question of terminology is really important, especially in a, in a place like Kuwait, where, where this example comes from, where the translators are local and are translating material and providing material to the NGOs who are funding the anti-honor killing initiative. And the translators are reporting on what is going on in the little villages around and so on, what they hear, what they know, and, but they don't have the language for it. Their terminology is family discipline. The NGO's terminology is, is uh, honor killing. And the translators are caught in this back and forth, traitors to their culture in a way. Yeah. So that's a, a thing that won't go away. Then the word of gender, the word gender itself and its translation um, is, has, has had lots of, lots of work written on it already, but what exactly it means in different, places and why it's so untranslatable. In, in Arabic, al gender. In German, the verb gendern. Uh, in French, genre sometimes, but also la théorie du genre. And you wonder, hmm, la théorie du genre, c'est quoi? Um, so we can see that these ideas are the concepts that come from a particular locality, um, Anglo-America, moving into other places need consideration. Um, many other examples. And I think to end up with, I'd like to cite Hala Kamal. Hala Kamal um, published an article in 2018 called Translating Feminist Literary Theory into Arabic. And it's long and interesting. And at the very end, she says, translation of feminist material into Arabic or into other non-Anglo-American European languages requires a deep understanding of terminology and theory. So unlike the naive translations of Russia of the 1990s, conscious understanding of translation process as one that requires interpretation, mediation and transformation. So trans to not translate gender is to not mediate it, I suppose, the word. And then re requires also reflection on the ethical implications of translating feminist texts and an awareness of the readership that you're addressing with your feminist translation in relation to the readers and the translators specializations. So does a translation require a preface? Does every the bottom of every page need to have a footnote or two or three uh, explanatory and so on? Yeah, so that's what I have to say. All the things that face us when we move from translate feminist translation in this tight little lo locality of Quebec and Toronto, perhaps Montreal and Toronto, uh, to this really broad, um, broad place that is, yeah, the entire world. <laughs> That's end of story. <laughs> I can't hear. Thank you so much for this fascinating journeys that the journey that you took us through it's just uh, you put into context the whole uh, history of, uh, of uh, feminist translation thank you so much for that and okay. i was following every word you said i have so many questions and so many i could interact with every word you said but i'm going to limit myself and <laughs> <laughs> and allow others to to participate uh, mm -hmm. We have about 125 participants from all over the world. I'm so excited about uh, about this. And we have uh, participants from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, from Algeria, Tunisia. And it's really for, for me, this is what this is the transnational uh, action that, uh, that mm. that's, that's mm. happening now. Uh, I, I just wanted to also add to, uh, to what you said about Hala Kamal. That is, I came across a really good um, podcasts on uh, BBC, mm -hmm. BBC World, and it's a brilliant podcast if you can listen to it. Uh, it's called, I think, Feminist Translation. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, she, she really explains the, uh, her, her work and so on. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I, I, as I told you, I have come across uh, feminist translation, transnational feminist, uh, f feminism and so on, and all the local, the, the global and so on. When I was working on, uh, and I'm, I still do, when I was working on my project on narratives and translations of um, Algerian uh, women, um, women survivors of the 1990s. Uh, these stories that we, we, we don't hear about in the uh, stories actually that went under the radar and uh, not a lot is uh, particularly testimonies by women survivors and I came I came uh, I've been working on the on the, on the topic for, uh, for for about four years now what I realized uh, is um, that uh, uh, when writing, when trying to translate the research into English, we don't just face English, we also face the hurdle of academic English. Mm -hmm. And not also academic English, but also the way theory, the way the, the, the articles and the way uh, academic writing is actually laid out. The, the, the theory side, how, uh, and that in, 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 in my case has, has stopped me from, uh, producing the material that I wanted to be out there. So to be listening to you and to read your work and to be engaging with you tonight is, is, is kind of liberating to me as someone who has lived in, the, <laughs> yeah, in, the, in, the, in an Anglophone country for, for, for 27 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I could not, at, at one point I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find the link between that big side, side of me, which is the, uh, the activist side. And yeah. also the academic side, because I wanted something that would merge the two. And this is basically, and also as a, as a practitioner, as a as a translator as well. So I, I wonder if you've if you've had other uh, other maybe colleagues who face this, or it's probably just me. But definitely the language, English, and so on, is something to be to be discussed. Yeah, yeah. I think I think this question of, of <coughs> theories of theories traveling and, and being applicable elsewhere is really problematic. It's, it's theories can be inspirational, I suppose, but elsewhere, say in, in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia, the theories sh should or could or come from whatever practice is there and not necessarily, there and, and not necessarily taken from the West and, and plopped plumped on top of what's happening there. And that's another thing that we noticed in producing the Rutledge Handbook is that very often the articles that come from China, the article that comes from India, the article that comes from Egypt refers to feminist translation um, as devised in Canada 30 years mm. ago. <laughs> you think, oh no, <laughs> it, 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 it really doesn't necessarily apply. And yeah. So it's 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 tricky. I think um, some of the material that's coming out of out of Egypt, and there's an article by Doa Mbabi, and there was another one from Morocco, Bushra Lagzali, and they tend to move away, or they try to move away from from this from this this uh, yeah Anglo-American line, and and devise other ways of looking at at the feminist translation and the interest in feminist work that is evident around them and that may not always fit uh, with, with what we did here 30 years ago. But one question that I thought when you said the women survivors, the women yeah. survivors from, from the 1990s of Algeria, that is an issue that, that um, my co-writer Alanoud al Sharek also comments on English has decided to refer to survivors of rape, survivors of sexual assault, survivors of this, survivors of that. She says, Alanud says, for what's going on in other parts of the world, a more appropriate word is victims. <laughs> but exactly. because, yeah, because we are so, um, in the English world, there's much more of a, a, a move towards euphemism, yeah. domestic violence for instance, ha, <laughs> is an English term, right? <laughs> Which makes things, it makes it rather vague what's going on here. And the same thing with survivors. 
whereas the word victims would be much more um, appropriate, appropriate in certain cases. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are, yeah, there are many, many um, things to discuss that, that are, that come out of the local environment and the local context where translation is being done, where the kind of a more generalized uh, theory may not apply. Exactly. Yeah. And it, yeah. definitely I can, I can just reiterate that it, when, I'm, when I'm working in, uh, on Arabic, for example, the word sabi in Arabic has a positive connotation, whereas in English we say just refer to it as rape. So these are all nuances that and 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 uh, and explanation that definitely we have to 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 bear in mind when we are translating into yeah. into other into the other language. But as I said, thank you so much. I don't want to monopolize the uh, the discussion. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, my colleague Olga definitely probably will have uh, something to say. Olga. <laughs> Can Where we see she? Olga? <laughs> Sorry, I was she is. <laughs> myself. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, as I as I said in the chat, uh, Luis, it's always a pleasure to uh, to listen to you, and there is always um, something new to learn. So thank you very much for such an insightful talk. Um, I think I've I've read everything you um, you've written, and still today it was like, wow, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So it was fascinating. Um, I I do have a question. I was just trying to. I thought it might be easier if I um, pasted it on on the chat. Um, right, so, so just to, to give you some context about the question as well, um, it's about the idea of solidarity, which is key in transnational feminism. And of course, I have my own linguistic limitations. I cannot read all languages, of course, but most of the work that I am reading about feminist translation um, is done by middle class women. Mm -hmm. Women that, you know, um, may come from many different backgrounds, uh, perhaps defined by different identities or categories. Um, some of us migrants, minority cultures, some of us come from working class families. That's, that's my case, but we are now in academia, we are in centers of power. So I think there is a class thing here. And my, my question is, in transnational um, feminist translation studies, how do we break the class barrier <laughs> that I think keeps marginalized women marginalized from these discourse? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so sometimes I've got the, I've got the impression that um, uh, it's us um, in 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 academia who are producing these knowledge about marginalized women and then they have to see themselves through the lens of middle class women writing English. So how do we break the class barrier? I'm gonna put it on, on the chat now, sorry. I'm really bad at doing two things at the same time. <laughs> so I couldn't, um, I'm gonna put it in the chat now, but yeah, Thanks. that was my question. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Olga, thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an interesting question, I think that uh... My student, Nezrin Bessaï, that I talked about, who put together or was working on this book called Corps à Corps, she, she first, she encountered those, those marginalized groups in the focus groups, uh, women who are disabled, for instance, or women who are in, in, in English, there's a, or in French, there's the term now racialisé. I, I think it's been taken over into English as racialized, but who suffer suffer racial discrimination. Um, and they had input on the translation of that one particular book, Cor à Cor, which is yeah, a guide, the guide to positive sexuality. But how else, how else? I, I really don't know. I mean, university, academia, and publication is almost by definition a middle-class activity, right? It's, it doesn't come from high finance. It doesn't come necessarily from any, any upper crust um, or conservative movement. It is by definition middle-class. Um, yeah, and so then reaching out and bringing in other, other groups might be one way of doing it, but then you get this situation where you have the, 
domineering, or you could get the situation where you have a domineering academic who knows everything, who will interview and, and interpret the words of, of, of that marginalized person, which, which Kate Sturge has written about that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very, a very interesting problem. I don't know. I, I think that Raimondes, Maria Raimondes, has written about it as well, right? Um, about the, the Tamil women's groups and translating their work into Galician so that, that we don't always have to go via English or, yeah. So there are, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know either. I mean, it's a real question. It's something that has been like making me think a lot lately. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have any. Well, I have some ideas, but not like a, a real like final answer. But thank you for, for that. Thanks. The moment you write about it, the moment you write an article on some such topic, you raise it into middle class academia. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to carry a banner and walk down the street. It's Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Olga. I, I, I think I'll take this opportunity to advertise for your event next uh, Saturday on the same, at the same time. Uh, Olga's, uh, um, Olga's talk is on feminist activism and translation in a, transla a transnational world. And it's, as I said, next Saturday uh, from, uh, from, six, from six to seven. And I will advertise for Ruth's as well later on. Thank mm -hmm. you. And I think now I move on to some questions. Thank you. I have uh, some questions here. The first one is uh, by Abdal. It says, how did the, uh, between, uh, between brackets, how did the ordinary women of, from Quebec see the actions of feminist translators and their acts of translating. Did they regard it too, too militant or unnecessary mild? Mm -hmm. What was the word in, in quotation marks? Uh, ordinary. Auxiliary? Uh, no, ordinary women. And I think you can check, you can look at the button Q&A and you can read the questions there yourself there. Can you? Okay, Q&A, I see. see them? It. Yeah. The first yeah. one, Abdal. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, ordinary women of Quebec. I think you know. I, I there there has been a certain amount of material written on the fact that these experimental texts uh, that were produced were not really accessible to ordinary women. There, there's been criticism of that, that such experimentalism in language and in literature is aimed at and written for a, an elite, an elite that can read that stuff and that is interested in it and is willing to do the, the, the work of interpretation, of, of reading, understanding. I mean, how many people are willing to read Judith Butler in, you know, for, for pleasure or Jacques Derrida for pleasure? Those are difficult texts that have to be worked at. And so I think a lot of the Quebec material was also very difficult, but what they had was, because it was so local, they had open air um, conferences, they had activities, poem reading activities, uh, love poem reading activities, and erotic poem reading activities, which brought in uh, more, uh, a bigger crowd and which, and also in the journals that they, they published in and that the magazines that were there, La Vie en Rose is a really interesting magazine, which, which um, involves political, has political uh, articles, but then suddenly a literary article, which with, with, with those politics then put into more literary terms. So there was a, there was a lot of um, collaboration between or a lot of work that was physical and oral and theatrical, but also written, difficult. And then the theatrical and the performance aspect of it makes it more consumable, makes it more accessible. But you're right, a lot of it, if you re only read that stuff, it's labor, hard labor. <laughs> I've translated some of it into English. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I would 
rather veer off and do other translations now. <laughs> th th thank you so much. Maybe we pass on to uh, uh, Ruth Abu Rashid, please. Thank you, um, Louise. Hello, Louise. Thank you so much for your talk. It really is. Um, it was, um, as you, as uh, Olga was saying, it certainly brought me back to the first days when I was reading about your work while being a practicing translator in the, I'd say definitely in the, when I was, I suppose, translating in very transnational and refugee settings before I decided to put that, mm. my, put the experiences into, I suppose, into more an academic context. And I would just like to ask you, uh, obviously, Olga's talked about the issue of class, but I was also wondering whether you could expand a little bit. You, I think you have talked about this in previous talks in the past about the politics of censorship and location in transnational feminist, in the feminist translation context that you have had insights into or have worked with yourself. I know censorship comes across in different forms, but I think it'd be really interesting to talk about what perhaps it's meant in the past or what you feel censorship means now. Mm -hmm. Good question. I, I'm not sure that I have been censored, have I? <laughs> I can't remember. I, I don't know, you forget the bad parts. You remember the good parts, right? Um, I think that censorship occurs actually really easily when you cannot get a translation contract for a certain book that you want to translate. You come across uh, an author that is absolutely feministically seductive and interesting and you, you, you want to translate that person and suddenly nobody's interested. None of the publishers to which you pitch the book or to which you propose, no one will touch it. And then you can ask, is that censorship or is that just business? Um, who, who knows? I mean, I, I had that experience with um, Hertha Müller. Hertha Müller, is, she won the Nobel Prize in 19, I don't know, 2008 or so. And before that, hardly translated into English. I had tried in the 1990s to find publishers who would would take my English translations of her work. Nobody wanted it. The moment she gets a Nobel Prize, poof, mm. she's translated. Right? And and so that that kind of that kind of thing comes up regularly. And it, I think it affects women writers, women writers, and as much more than men writers. But I I don't know. That's anecdotal. <laughs> Someone would have to. I think the article that Olga and and Helen. Helen Vassallo wrote in, in this book, in the Rutledge book, it's exactly on that topic. Are women writers more translated? Even that we, we, we call out the year of the woman's text in translation. And then what happens? Does that mean that thousands of books by women are translated? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, but I think that's one really obvious place. And then the other one that other people have written about, and that's, uh, what's her name, Pilar. Pilar Godayol, who writes about it, the, the translation of, of Anglophone writers into Spanish in the Franco period, where there was very heavy, heavy um, censorship by the state and by the censor. And she can go back and look at the censorship files and see how the censors um, affected the text. And also my one of my PhD students from Iran wrote about that, the censorship of, of that is imposed by by the Iranian system on all kinds of material. And then her question was, why is Margaret Atwood's the uh, was it the the Handmaid's Tale, the Handmaid's Tale, which <laughs> became this amazing American TV series last year or two years ago, that was translated in Iran into Persian. And her question is, why, why? Given the situation which we have, the context which we have there, um, why would they allow it to be translated? And then she checks the translation and sees, oh my goodness, it's 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 yeah, everything that that could be hidden and censored has been hidden and censored. Not only that, but also the book itself cannot be found on any library shelf. It has been put into the National Library behind locked doors. And so on and so forth. So it is published in translation, perhaps to demonstrate how open-minded the system is, but it's not available to anybody. And anybody who did read it would not be reading Margaret Atwood, but a very, very 
yeah, different version. So yeah, there are all kinds of, of censorships, yeah, that are interesting and, and nice to put your finger on, including, including something that I read most recently and which will come out as a book shortly on um, a famous, famous Argentinian translator and writer who translated Faulkner, translated Virginia Woolf, and made deliberate changes in them. The, the weak male character in Faulkner suddenly gets the strong language that the strong female character actually has and gets switched around. Or Orlando, Virginia Woolf's story about transitioning and about gender, gender kind of fluidity uh, gets completely changed. And yeah, so yeah, it, many, many different ways of censoring the material. <laughs> yeah, and I think the important thing is to point it out, to write about it, to write academic articles on it, and to not let up. Yeah, and to review what other people have said about it so that to review those articles, to do book reviews, that's all hard work, hard academic work, but it's an unpaid and unthanked, but yeah, it's necessary. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, interesting because it's also the they, because in Arabic, for example, the word censorship, rakabe, it actually means to observe, to be watched. Mm. Um, and so the um, so when I think of censorship, if I think in my other language, I'm thinking it's like, well, who's watching, who's observing, who's making those interventions and at which point. And, you know, as you said about if you're seeing a work that's been changed, is it the translator doing that work? Is it the editor who is observing what the translation is doing? Um, and um, how and is it the publisher? Where does it go? You can you like what you've talked about before, the multiplicity of mm -hmm of solidarities, you, I think you were also the way what your um, responses have made me think there's a multiplicity of, of I suppose, how this is observed, how this is managed, how, um, how, I suppose, what, what, I suppose, what the reader receives, what the reader thinks they are reading um, yeah. as, as a translation. Um, so yes, the, it's your earlier references to multiplicity, um, it's a very fruitful way of looking at it. The, yeah. My question would be, why is the term watch to watch or to observe, threatening. Why I should think, that be perceived as threatening? Well, I suppose I'll talk about in the talk, but in many different to be watched, it usually means someone who is an official censor. That is their job. So in English, it's obviously censor is always seen as, as is, is, is negative. Um, and in Arabic, it has become negative because of the physical effects. So mm -hmm. people producing certain works, the works either don't appear or even worse, the people themselves disappear. So that's yeah. the, so it's more about the association, the impact of that process of observation. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But in English, it's more, it's, it's, it's the explicitness. There's a more, I suppose, a more nuanced, I suppose, I wouldn't say it's nuanced, but you know, there's a difference. Observation can be seen as something quite neutral. Um, yeah. Whereas they censor. Or interest, expressing interest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if Fenisa, if you have, you know, in the Algerian context, definitely um, you're was, looking across yeah. many the, the Berber, the yeah. as, you know, Amazigh context, the French context, the um, Arabic context. So that's probably another discussion. But definitely, the connotation yeah. of what censorship can mean when you think about it in a different language. That's mm -hmm. the, definitely the case in Algeria. Well, uh, and also I could add to that that there are certain topics that would not be pub published by local publishers there. Because mm -hmm. there is an, an institutionalized, uh, an institutionalized uh, form of censorship. It can be a law. It can be, as uh, as Ruth was talking about, the, the word raqaba in itself is sometimes in us. We feel like we have yeah. watched, we are observed. Uh, there is someone who is uh, behind uh, be, be behind you, looking at your. Uh, looking at what you're doing, so the, it has it has definitely a, a, a cultural uh, cultural impact. And I'm again going to just publicize for uh, Ruth's uh, talk next Saturday at six. Uh, Iraqi women's stories, rereading their their pathways of activism in translation. And again, as I said, it's on Saturday next Saturday at the same time. It will be we will have series of uh, uh, talks on Saturdays at six. And now probably I will also um, uh, ask a, a student, I have two students actually working, two PhD students working on feminist translation. Arine Al-Jalal is one and Sarah Al-Shamran. 
uh, maybe Arin, please, can we have Arin? And then you have other questions, uh, uh, Louise, on the Q&A, please. I see, yeah. Yeah, Arin, can we see you prob probably? If, if you want. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, but we can't see you. Yeah, just a second. Sure. Arin is working on the Sidao Convention. She's working on the retranslation of the Sidao. She's really producing brilliant work. She's from Saudi Arabia. Okay. And if, if not, if, if we can't, uh, maybe we, if we could have maybe uh, Emmanuel now. And then we go back to Arin. Uh, Arin probably will give you some time to sort out your camera. Uh, Emmanuel is uh, is a colleague of mine, who's who is with us. Thank you so much for attending, Emmanuel. Where is Emmanuel? Hello. Hey. Can you Thank hear you me? We can do. Yeah, we can. I don't know if my camera is working. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, matter. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'd like to thank uh, Anissa for organizing this, of course. Thank you so much. And Luis for um, giving this brilliant presentation. Um, I do have a question, Luis, and I appreciate that you've said that you yourself haven't been working very much with intersectionality, but you, you have uh, clearly read and is really uh, aware of that. You have people working under your supervision who are doing this work and you're clearly having a lot of conversations with them. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the polemic with the translation of the poems by uh, Amanda Gordon. The, <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, and in and, and Catalan uh, and in, in Dutch. Um, and now we have a big article about that in Portuguese. Um, and of course, uh, the media is covering it in a rather uneven way. Um, I have read a very useless, I would say, article in The Guardian. Um, I have read more uh, informed and more nuanced discussions elsewhere. But one of the things that I have been finding interesting, Louise, is that many colleagues I do that I do know and who work on translation, who are translators themselves, are coming across with uh, views on the matter that, that, uh, that, that I find very interesting to say the least but you know this very idea of yeah well literature is universal so everyone can translate so why could we translate homer today if we mm -hmm. were to be doing this um but uh, uh, so I i'd like you to to ask your view because um it's really interesting because even people who who don't who are not really aware of this very um uh, how can I call it, the activist translation, right? The translation that is committed with everything, which is committed with the body. I mean, Gorman's poem has to do, the, the, the mean is the message, the, the word is the message, the spoken word is the message that going through the body of a young activist black woman who went through certain struggles in her life, that was all part of the message. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I also understand that there are not enough translators in the market who come from this uh, backgrounds, of course, for, for the very reasons that you and other colleagues have pointed out this afternoon. Um, but I'm finding very interesting because even if, if we were to all think, okay, let's welcome uh, people who can do the translations of, say, of the certain aspects of the performance of that state of being, um, there still has to be room made for these people, which means that some people, for example, let's say the person who would be translating Gorman's um, um, poem perhaps 30 years ago without any controversy, today this person would not get the job. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could comment anything or at least your views on the polemic to this, the extent that you are aware of it and, and, and just- Yeah, yeah. I'm very much aware of it because two years ago, uh, we held a small symposium here at the University of Ottawa on exactly that topic on uh, identity politics and translation. Who can translate whom? And how these things develop and how, how they're decided. And it came out of a very strange situation or, or interesting situation because I had a contract to translate um, a book from German into English. The book was written by an author born 1975 who, when he heard that I would be translating his book said, no, she's too old. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, oh, 
what a what a what a what a shock and then we we thought about it and said what other reasons would there be why someone doesn't want you to translate their book or why you're not deemed um acceptable to translate a book and we came up with well we had talks on the on the question of indigenous writers in canada indigenous writers who are translated by established white university professors da 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 da, da. is that appropriate is it inappropriate can they can people um, empathize with the text written by an indigenous writer and so on and and this plays exactly into into the question around around the poem uh, for uh, that that you mentioned the Amanda Gorman poem um, about identity politics and one one really good response has been by a woman uh, whose name is Heidi Kotze. I don't know if you know that article. The author is K. His author's name is written as K O T Z E, and her first name is Heidi H A I D E E. And her argument is basically that it's time to make room and to push over and to make room for other translators who might be more appropriate, not absolutely appropriate, but more appropriate to translating, you know, specific kinds of texts that are that are perhaps deemed sensitive or deemed important for identity reasons and so on. It has nothing to do with translating Homer. It has nothing to do with translating Dostoevsky. But there are sensitive moments in culture and in cultural encounters where it is wise to think about such, such things. And, and her point is, is that, for instance, in the case of the Dutch translator, the publishing house had been struggling, competing with four, five, six other Dutch publishing houses who all wanted the, to be able to put out that particular translation. And when the publishing house got the contract, probably for enormous amounts of money, uh, the, the most visible, the most successful young writer was chosen to translate again for economic reasons, <laughs> primarily. And so it's, it's in a way, it's um, the argument is that it, maybe it's time to set aside some of these economic reasons and think in terms of, in, in other terms. And, and one of my academic friends here, Carolyn Shred, circulated some information and some commentary on that also, which said maybe it's time to, for those of us who are like, like Olga pointed out, white middle-class well-established university professors to step back a little bit and let let make room and deliberately make room and make space for others to to participate yeah that's i don't think that that author that that translator that young dutch writer who who was supposed to translate couldn't translate the text of course she could but perhaps it's time to invite someone else to translate that text Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for um, for your question. And also, I have uh, uh, in the chat you have uh, uh, colleagues who have uh, who have uh, put in the links. For example, Hillary. Thank you so much for putting the link for uh, Kutsi's uh, article. Uh, the, the 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 chat is also really interesting. Uh, could could I maybe have Arin uh, again, please? Hi. Good evening. Hi, Arin. I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't work the camera out. Um, That's okay. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Professor Louise, for this very informative and interesting talk. I'm a big fan of you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to ask you a couple of questions. The first uh, question is, would you describe the feminist translation strategies uh, of the Canadian school as radical strategies in terms of the interference in the source text? Uh, and the second question is, how challenging is it to uh, to change the, the sexist language in a legal context, um, a family law, for instance? Uh, should we follow a gradual or radical approach when changing that? Thank you. Yeah, it depends what you mean by radical, right? <laughs> yeah, in, in Canada, the, the feminist approaches to translation the strategies, so-called, um, I've, I've listed them and described them in, in various 
various kind of encyclopedic articles and so on, the most radical is to change the text, to actually make changes in the text because you don't like what the text says. Um, and that is done and has been done historically regularly by all kinds of translators without ever pointing out that it has been done. It's been done secretly, quietly, because not too many people bother to look at the original text and the translation and compare them. Just those of us who are interested in translation studies do that, very few others. So such changes could historically pass unseen or un, you know, without anyone knowing. The difference for the feminist approaches of the Canadian variety was that they pointed to, they explained what they were doing. They said, hooray, I, am, I have so much power as a translator, I can change this text, which I do not like, and which I do not like for the following reasons, and I'm in, inserting you know, a female pro, a feminine pronouns instead of having all male pronouns or whatever. I, I refuse to use the term masters of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> when it's contradiction in terms in a way, mostly, <laughs> etc. So that's that's one of the things that in the in the Canadian approach could be called radical. Um, wh what's radical is not so much changing the text as admitting and and celebrating the fact that you're changing the text. Um, in terms of legal documents, it, I think it really depends where you are, for whom you're translating. And, and if it's a legal document, what does that legal document um, mean once it has been translated? Um, there, I think uh, one would have to be pretty careful if you're translating a court document, if you're translating divorce documents, if you're translating um, inheritance wills and testaments and things like that. I think, uh, yeah, you, one would have to proceed with caution and it's different it's different from, it's a different type of text to translating a literary text or a, a poem. Um, a legal text has, has, can trigger actions, can trigger decisions that can be very important. So yeah, it, it would be, it would be complicated and it would need uh, more of a consensus in the legal community or perhaps even at, at, uh, at legislative level, yeah. I don't know which, which language combinations you're talking about, but uh, I would proceed with caution. She's, yeah, she's working with uh, English and uh, uh, English and Arabic. Uh, probably w w what she means by, uh, by um, uh, radical, because she's comparing the, um, the strategies with the strategies taken by uh, Tunisian uh, translators. Mm -hmm. which she's finding that they have they have a more moderate approach so they're kind of taking into consideration the culture the religion and so on and she has like a really fascinating uh, comparison to she's, she's really making a very good uh, definitely mm -hmm. good progress and also like a really fascinating uh, comparison mm -hmm. between the two uh, Arine, did you want to ask the second one or? Um... Um, yeah, I just want to thank yes, Adri and uh, I, will, I meant by the hijacking strategy, uh, ah. like describing it, is it, is it radical or not? And since, um, like you said, is translating a legal text has legal consequences. So mm -hmm. are you saying that uh, feminist translation um, shouldn't be applied in a legal text? Oh, no. It, it can be applied in a legal yeah. text, but, but like, like Hala Kamal points out, um, the, the readership has to be considered and the impact of that translation, right? Yeah. Where it's going, who's going to use it, how it's going to be used, um, because it's not, it's not um, innocent. It's not, it's not it, 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 a legal text is much more maybe powerful or can be activated much more than a literary text. Right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it, maybe if we could uh, kindly ha have a look at the questions in the Q&A, please. We have nine. It's really like, uh, probably we won't be able to answer all of them, but if you could maybe choose one or two, or I'll leave it up to you. Uh, the first one has to do with translation apps, right? AI. Yeah. 
can AI translation go beyond the boundaries of gender, queer, and even fix them? I would say no. <laughs> and one of the reasons, well, it can eventually perhaps, but right now, um, AI memory, translation memories are fed with existing translations and existing translations from a long period of time dating from the probably the beginning of the century from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s and gender and gender questions were hardly an issue in a lot of those translations which are feeding AI systems. So that apparently, and I don't work on this, but I've in, in the handbook here that we published, there's one article by Johanna Monti, which uh, looks at how old fashioned and binary and stereotypical the language, the, gen, the question of gender is when you use AI machine translation, because apparently the, the absolutely regular um, designation for doctor is he and for nurse is she <laughs> in these <laughs> machine translated things. <laughs> And we know there are hundreds of thousands of women doctors in the world these days. <laughs> However, because these machines have been fed uh, with older texts and older translations, that is what determines what they spit out and what they produce. And there's apparently a center for um, the study of this problem at university, um, at Stanford University. It's listed. It's dis it's discussed in in that in that article, where where they're trying to figure out how to control this and how to bring the machine translation world up to date and so on. Yeah. So no, not at all. It it's not at it's it's going backward. In fact, at the moment. Thank you so, so much. That's Thank the first. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we can we maybe take one of the participants who have been raising their hands for a while? Yeah, yeah. Who? Please. There's one who's. We have four, I think. We'll take one, please. Yeah. Which, which one? I know Ida. I, I can see Ida Solberg from Norway. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Her question is: Could I elaborate on the link between feminist translation and feminist translation studies? Can feminist translation be useful for translators? Absolutely. Yes. I think feminist. If if translators, who have not been exposed to the ideas that are that are spread through feminist translation studies, if they are exposed to these ideas, I think then they are made or well, can be made more aware of what I call gender aware language or gender or the, the power of the gendered aspect of language and the gender in discourse, how gender is carried in discourse and, and expectations of gender are carried in discourse. So yes, I think that there's a, a really good use for feminist translation studies to be, to have an effect on uh, translators themselves. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to elaborate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Maybe uh, if we could ask uh, Dega to, to choose one, please, one of the questions. Dega. Um, I promoted Beatrix Sosa Martinez to speak. So please. if you're ready. Oh, right here. Hello. Uh, yeah, Beatriz. Yeah, hello. Hi. From Uruguay. Thank you very much. I really, um, my camera is on. I don't know why it's, I think it's uh, cut from the host. Anyway, um, I'm from Uruguay. I've been translating uh, since for many years now and trying to carry out for feminist translations for many years now and teaching translation mm -hmm. uh, with a feminist approach also for many years in local universities. Mm -hmm. First time was in 1991, we translated a book by Vandana Shiva into Spanish and we agreed with the editor that we needed a translator's note that included the concept of gender in Spanish, because in, at that time, it wasn't very widespread in Spanish. It was only um, related to language, if we spoke about gender. 
So mm -hmm. it was quite an experience. And, but my question and, and several other things, but my question today was different. What's about the use of transnational in this, uh, in your materials? I was struck by it because I, or in, in the way we understand it also, I associate it with business. Mm -hmm. And transnational is usually associated with an expansion of business from one country uh, to the others done by transnational corporations. Mm -hmm. Otherwise in the academia or in social environments, when you're trying to regard two cultures or two languages in an equal stand, you, you refer to multinational mm -hmm. or other terms. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an interesting problem. I wrote about it and in an article that I published in TTR. TTR is this Canadian translation studies journal. Um, last year it was published, and the, the transnational. You're right, has lots of applications. Um, it has this cultural application that 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 we are using right now for translation transnational translation studies, which has a kind of a um, yeah, collaborative feel. Um, but you're right, it could be used as well for business. But there, I think in English, we would use multinational. Multinational has got a negative, a negative feel in English. The multinationals are ruling the world and multinational um, Amazon or the multinational uh, car companies or whatever are, but it changed, that terminology changed because they, they are called now, now transnationals just because of that. Because it's like Maybe. IBM Bev, which is Brazil conquering the world or Amazon is the US and so on and so forth. So I, I think nowadays they were transnational. The okay. connotation of transnational is much worse. That's why I'm, I was asking. <laughs> yeah, I know. And if you look on if you look on Wikipedia, English language Wikipedia, and you look for the word transnational, there's a great long political um, discussion about what trans, how transnational is exactly that, uh, or refers to exactly that the, the colonialist, imperialist, expansionist notion of business and so on. But there's also the other side, and you'll find just as much. Um, uh, reference to transnational as a cultural um, phenomenon of multilingualism, multiculturalism, people moving across borders, people caring, not caring about borders of language and culture and so on. So it's, I'm sure it shifts back and forth and maybe these much, much uh, maligned multinationals have just latched on to the word transnational, which, which has had a which has had for some time at least a, a more positive flair and is not international, right? Transnational was, has been kind of used instead of international because international tends to refer to the institutions of the United Nations or UNESCO or World Health Organization or something like that. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tricky. tricky. It's tricky, I agree. I agree. Thank yeah. you. And okay. we just have Thank to you very much. insist just have to insist, you know, a, a few years ago in the 1970s, the term that often feminist writers would use to say we talk to each other across boundaries is supranational. Supra. Yeah. yeah. But that I, yeah. has disappeared or it seems to have disappeared. Yeah, because it, there was an attempt to, to have some kind of supranational um, mm. rule for anything and it has failed. Yeah. So eventually, I mean, the reality failed and then the language yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Probably we'll have an, the next one, uh, Dega, please, is, uh, who, who did you say? Uh, Rosie Marshland, please. Rosie. Hello. Hello. Please. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, awesome. You can, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for this amazing event. It's been awesome to attend, um, especially because I wrote my master's thesis on feminist translation a few years back. So it's been really nice to dive back into these oh, issues. Good. 
Um, my question, because I'm a, 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 I guess you might say a commercial translator, practicing translator, and I think that feminist translation, of course, has a role to play in translating legal texts has been mentioned, any, anything really. Um, and particularly in terms of the way that languages evolve for me is a big question because I'm a French to English translator and we've got uh, écriture inclusive in French and the rise of the singular they in English. And I was wondering if you think that, yeah, what feminist translation can do to help language evolve? <laughs> Yeah, good question. I think it's not so much translation that can help language evolve as writing about translation. I think one of the things that, that we as academics should be doing and should be doing all the time is writing about what we're doing and writing about the importance of it and writing about the political um, influences of it and so on. I mean, in Germany right now, this, this thing where the Duden Dictionary has decided that it will have a separate entry for all the masculine and feminine forms, that is, that is an attempt to change language and it's meeting huge, huge opposition. But it can be promoted and it can be uh, supported by articles, by academic articles, by someone did an interview with me, with me, one of my students from the 90s when I was teaching in, in Freiburg at, at the University of Freiburg, got hold of me, he's now a journalist, and we talked about this and whoop, he wrote an article on, on this, this um, opportunity really to finally agree, yes, there are, there, there, there is the option to find a feminine form, create a feminine form, and use a feminine form of a whole number of, of words which have always claimed or which have always been used as though they were, um, in, they were inclusive. And yeah, it, I think it's not so much translation as writing about it that, that is important. Yeah. Translations disappear or translations, people don't, don't do the comparative work um, that they would need to do in order to really see what a translation does, unless someone does that comparative work and then and then displays it, writes about it. Wow. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. I think what I think of when I'm thinking about it, it's more about the fact that if if I translate something from French to English and I use a they rather than a he or a, even just a he she, which I think is personally I don't really like stylistically. Um, I'm participating in increasing the use of that and making it yes. more normalized. Yeah. And same with equal to inclusive, like that's, I mean, that's a way further back debate. Um, the, 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 the French Academy Francaise is not accepting this, but it's slowly, painstakingly making, making waves. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I think it's the only way is translators if you're a commercial translator like me and you don't hit, you are totally invisible, you can somewhat in some way make a make an impact with your yes. work. Yeah. You will come across problems when you use they and them self. Self singular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh it's 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 always a work in progress, isn't it? We're always um trying to find, uh -huh. find solutions as a as a yeah. as a translator. Word, word will not allow that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, thank, thank you so much. I, I don't know if I could, if you could have Nora Al, Al Karashi, I think. Please, Nora. Nora. Hi, hello. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can, okay. yeah. Go ahead, please, yeah. Hi, Louise, it's good to see hello. you. Yeah. Ah, Nora. Think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The same Nora. <laughs> the same Nora. Okay. Good. Good. Good to. Good. No, I am a student of Louise uh, um, at the School of uh, Translation, University of Ottawa. Oh, perfect. Uh, and uh, thank you, Anissa, for organizing this. Um, it's really wonderful, and I look forward for uh, um, Abu Rashid's lecture uh, um, shortly. Yeah. yeah. In two weeks' but time. My 
Yeah, my question this morning, I actually, I raised my hand a while ago. I kind of forget about it because I had so many questions. All the, all, like, it's a very rich discussion. And thank you all for raising all those wonderful questions, honestly, and the answers. And I wrote so many notes down. But I'll make it simple and light. Um, maybe uh, I can post those questions to Luis at some point. Um, what would you recommend uh, for reading you know, to cultivate the vocabulary, the feminist vocabulary, and to publish in terms of journal and not so much academic, like uh, magazines, um, uh, places where we can be involved in such discussion. What is like uh, popular these days, if you know, of outlet, uh, but also books, not necessarily journals. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So where would one publish about feminist translation and read or about feminist approaches to translation in journals mm. that's not necessarily uh, academic. Yeah, and mm. people, what are they doing and how they're doing it? Uh, mm. it, it's, it seems to me, maybe because I'm, I'm new to this whole field, um, mm. it's a little bit, um, I'm overwhelmed that it's everywhere, but if you can give some suggestions for places, mm -hmm. uh, well, that would be so. There's a think. journal that comes from University of Texas uh, called Translation Review, and it is, it is very closely associated with ALTA, which is the American Literary Translators Association. So very, very interested in translation praxis rather than translation theory. And I know that for a fact that they are changing their, their approach, their path at the moment, what they're looking for, and are interested in finding, finding material or getting material that has to do with the praxis of translation. So not, not only academic assessments and analyses, but stuff that has to do with literary translation practice. Other than that, hmm, it's hard, it's hard. One would, have to, one would have to try to write for something like the Los Angeles Review of Books or for Harper's or for, you know, for one of these large distribution journals. And then you have to make it very, very interesting or very political. Um, yeah, and it depends totally on, on who the editor is and what the, what, the, what the topics are. I mean, around this Amanda Gorman text, mm -hmm. it's the first time that translation or the first time in a long time that translation has seen such public interest. So <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe this might push things in a in a new direction who knows, mm -hmm. who knows? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but it's that's difficult, uh, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh you mean publishing or reading about it or publishing yeah. publishing in in other journals other than academic journals mm -hmm. very different mm -hmm. the general How public has not learned to be interested in in translation issues at least not in english maybe mm -hmm. in other languages i don't know mm -hmm. i know that in german often translations cause scandals um, mm -hmm. and are written up in, in newspapers and so on. But uh, in English, never, hardly ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. How about following such a conversation? Uh, is there certain uh, places where you, you personally go to to read about these things? Or no. is it just uh, we follow <laughs> authors? <laughs> <No. laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I just probably from the question Q and A probably we'll go back to the Q and A. Maybe if we could have uh, Amira El El Mash El Mashjari. El Mashjari. El Mashjari, please. And then probably for the uh, participant, that's the uh, th this is the last question. Hello. Take one or two from the Q and A. It's for the Amira. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. I, I know it's like toward the end. Thank you, Professor Louise, for such an interesting talk. I am a PhD student at the University, the Queen's University in Belfast, and my work is like around gender and the translator voice, and I cannot go away from the feminist, feminist translation. So my question to you is, isn't feminist translation nowadays shifted from a political perspective to a woman empowerment, positive social perspective? And don't you see that this movement can help in making it less challenging and more acceptable from society and academia in general? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So feminist, you think 
feminist translation has shifted from a political perspective to a woman empowerment, positive social perspective. Like nowadays, no, the word- I don't think the one excludes the other. Indeed, but when you think about it in a translation concept, if you translate it to Arabic to Nasawiya, it's gonna sound negative, but if you translate it to Tamkin al Mara, it's gonna be something like, wow, you're doing an amazing job here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe the, the language pair has, is what determines whether we're talking about or whether we see translation as a uh, or feminist translation from a political perspective or from a more social perspective you know the the language pair that you're working with i didn't understand your reference to to uh, mm -hmm. arabic but i assume or understand that perhaps if you're translating english into arabic there are places where you have to be careful or places where you have to be more circumspect. You can't be as direct or as, as well, direct or aggressive, if you want to use that term, as you might be, or as you could be, as you want to be. So you have to tone it down. You have right. to, yeah, make it less challenging, like you say, and more acceptable. But to whom? Less challenging to whom? Mm. More acceptable to whom? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's that's it. That's the exact what I'm working question. on is a Jane Austen text, Pride and Prejudice, and as we can look at it as a radical uh, novel written in a feminist point of view. So translating it to Arabic from a point of view that can really encourage women empowerment, can make mm -hmm. it more acceptable and more like, um, let's say, a way in a positive sided, not a negative sided. When you think about culture, mm -hmm. like the audience more mm -hmm. than the international concept of feminism itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like, again, like Hala says at the end of her article, you have to be aware of who you're, whom you're trying to reach with your translation. Who is the target audience? What can that target audience that you imagine um, accept? What can be useful? What can be helpful for that target audience? Yeah, so there are various, it's not, it's not an absolute, um, there's no absolute answer as possible, I don't think. It's been very much contingent. That word was around for a while about translation. Translation is contingent on the context and on the readership and on the political atmosphere and so on. Yeah, so it's never, never absolute. That's interesting. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. I probably would just maybe refer to the work of uh, Tunisian, um, Tunisian uh, scholars who are actually coining and who are using uh, a language that is, that is so well studied. And the, by, by this, I can refer you to the work of uh, Amel Grami, Professor Amel Grami, who is, I think, she's the first one to, uh, to start up a gender studies MA in Tunisia. I think it's the first one in the whole of the Maghreb. And she's also the, the one who has, who is editing the first series in, uh, on gender uh, uh, or in gender studies. Uh, she uses actually, the language she uses is such a beautiful and such well thought of, and she, do, she does take uh, into consideration the theories and so on. So maybe I refer you to, 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 to that. Uh, probably if we could take maybe one, one more question from the Q&A. One or two questions, and then we. There's I'm a so, question. Mm -hmm. There's a question I'd like to answer, which says, "How can you write yourself into a PhD thesis in translation studies as a feminist activist, given the academic conventions and expectations?" <laughs> right. It depends where you are. Again, the context. The context uh, says it all, or tells you all. Um, in Canada, for instance, you could easily write a PhD thesis on some kind of feminist activist aspect of translation, no problem. In New Zealand, I, I was the external examiner for a, a PhD that was written by a Chinese student, but she was studying at the University of Auckland, no problem. It was all about um, uh, Chinese women writers and and their how they were being handled in translation and how, yeah, and feminist aspects of that. So it depends where you are and depends who controls the, the conventions and the traditions and the customs uh, and the expectations of academia. So 
if feminist, anything with a feminist label is considered not academic or poor quality or silenced, then you will have difficulty doing your PhD thesis in that particular place. Yeah, I, I, I hope that's an answer. <laughs> it's so contextual, all of this, all of this material, yeah. And thank you so much. There was a question from Omar in the Q&A. You, yeah. Omar, who joined us from Morocco, and I'm so impressed with the number of students who are engaging from different parts of the world. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Great. I, I would love to meet everybody in person. That makes it so much more <laughs> <Me> interesting. <laughs> so, Omar, from, from Morocco, uh, I think. You Morocco? Yeah. Do I think that feminism has so far fulfilled its core goals? I wish. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's had an influence. Let's say that it certainly had an influence and it certainly had an influence in in Anglo-American uh, culture, society, politics, in European culture, society, politics. And I know that it is making moving things in in Egypt right now. And there have been there have been feminist activities in many, many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. There was there was. Um, and in China, there was a, a research group recently at the University of Glasgow who started from the idea that women's social status in the world has changed significantly since 1945. So since the end, uh, since the middle of the century. And they, they uh, ascribed it to feminist activity. And then the research question of the large group was, how did translation of feminist material lead to and support this change in social status, which so many women have experienced in so many different parts of the world, not in all parts of the world and not in a steady rise and not um, in the same way everywhere. And uh, yeah, and then they looked at what kind of texts had been translated from which language to which language and what effects had one could register or not and whether texts were for forbidden or prohibited and whether there was censorship in some places and so on all kinds of questions arose from that but i think i think certainly feminism hasn't fulfilled all those <laughs> fulfilled its core goals no but it's it has certainly um um invigorated thinking along those lines and it's certainly inspired certain people to go in certain directions and it certainly has put pressure on governments and on cultural institutions and on religious institutions and so on so it has has had a a nice effect it just and and now it seems that there's a a strong young wave of scholars who are again interested and who have who, who have got all the power and energy that comes with being 30 years old <laughs> to, to pursue it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think it just will keep going. Yeah. So thank you so much. I was going to ask you a question. I was going to say in 2000, in 2011, you said uh, it's time to talk about women. And I was going to tell you in 2012, in 2021, is it, are we still there? Have we, have we talked about women? Uh, particularly in this really timely, in this, in this I think 10 years on, uh, the world is, the world keeps like revealing so many, so many nasty, nasty uh, stuff about what's happening to women. For example, a timely, uh, uh, recently, about two weeks ago, a female student called uh, Sarah Everard, I don't know if you've heard about uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just shocked us how uh, she was, the way she was killed and by whom and so on. And every, uh, from January to uh, till now, the, uh, during this pa pa pandemic, about 50 Algerian women have been killed. 50 from January till now. Uh, recently, also, there was a case of a, 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 a very young uh, um, comedian, Algerian comedian, whose video has been published online, video of her intimate relationship with her husband, just basically exposing her body to, 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 to the... And you just realize like how much 
uh, work is needed, activism yeah. as well as scholarly, uh, as, uh, yeah. as what we do in academia. Yeah, and, and constant. It, it, it is not wise to let up. There's a whole movement right now in Mexico about what they call feminicidio. So the fact that there are probably 50 women a week that are killed yes. in Mexico. And, and not only in Mexico, in Mexico, there's a political movement uh, around this topic right now, but in, in other parts, in many other parts of the world. Yeah, and, and often by their, their nearest partners, mm -hmm. by their mm -hmm. most intimate connections. Yeah, so it's feminist translation is just a tiny little, tiny, tiny little fragment of the work, of work that can go in that direction. But yeah, it's the, I guess the question is, uh, not it's time to talk about women again, but it's time to keep talking. <laughs> exactly, women. exactly. I have, uh, I have uh, Sarah Al Ayashi who says Algerian women are still facing patriarchy, especially in rural rural areas and in cities that are not uh, Algiers. Like outside Algiers, definitely there is like mm -hmm. it's 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 got to the to 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 the point where they call it femicide. Yeah. So I uh, I know that we have taken so much of your uh, of your time. I don't know whether you want to add anything or you wanted to answer any other question or probably we will just uh, uh, resume. Thank you so much. I, I'll first leave it to you whether you want to answer any other question or shall we just? Uh... No, I just want to say thank you for inviting me. I I have had a long, cold, isolating winter here in Canada. So it's very nice to see people <laughs> and to talk to people and to hear what they have to say and to respond. And so it's very, yeah, very pleasant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so yeah. much for this really fascinating talk. Thank you for gathering us on a topic that is really close to her. And thank you for all the people who have, uh, who have participated from the different parts of the world. Apologies for those whom we could not answer the questions as the time, that's it, the time is up. And thank you so much for, for uh, kicking off this, uh, this series with this excellent talk. Thank you so much.